We are recording. Uh, so welcome uh, to the Libraries for Research Data session, uh, the interest group. And uh, I'm Chris Erkman. Um, so I, I work at the University of North Carolina um, Renaissance Computing Institute, um, primarily on a project for NIH on um, uh, called Bi Biodata Catalyst. It's a big data analysis platform. Um, I'll turn it over to my uh, co-chair, uh, colleague, uh, Ingrid, or Birgit, sorry, <laughs> that's the one on my NIH uh, project, Birgit, um, so if you wanted to introduce yourself, uh, and yeah. maybe Andy will join us shortly here too. Yeah, so welcome all, I'm, I'm Birgit Schmidt from the University of Göttingen, I work in the library, and I head a unit which is called Knowledge Commons, um, all kinds of open science projects, and some are concerned with research data management, and I'm a member of several committees, including LIBOR, uh, Executive Board, and uh, co-chairing this group since a number of years. Andy joins us later, but let's see when she comes in, then we give her a minute of frame <laughs> to introduce herself. I mean, well, yeah, we also you... have Marta as well. Uh, um, Marta, is Marta in the room? Yeah. So Marta, up to Hello. you. Yay. If you want to introduce yourself, Marta. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is uh, Marta Teterek, and I'm from Tiudat. I'm the head of research data services, and I used to be one of the co-chairs of this group. And I'm really happy and proud to be to have been able to contribute to lots of activities. But I have stepped down this year due to other obligations. But thanks so much for all the fantastic work that the group has been doing. It has been a pleasure. Yeah, and that's why we think. Um, one of our next steps is to uh, have an election again. <laughs> so this is part of um, this introduction. I mean, we have um, a history, of course, of this group. And um, um, just, I mean, for the uh, meeting, please please keep yourself muted as, as long as you are not speaking. And of course, you may raise your hand when you would like to speak in the way of like, like I'm doing now or in the chat. I mean. So Chris, keep an eye on this a little bit, <laughs> uh, or Andy when she joins or Marta. Um, and, um, and we will, I mean, maybe Chris, you go to the, to the little history slide. Um, uh, we are as a group um, started with the birth of a feather session in the second plenary in Washington. And since then we have always reconvened as, as a group and we had a number of Co-chairs um, during these years, um, you see the names up there, Kathleen Chira, Michael Witt, uh, Wolfram Horsman, and most recently also Julianus Schneider, who joined as the co-chair together with Marta, and Marta is still up there as the outgoing co-chair. And um, a next step would be um, to, to run an election, and we would ask you also through the mailing list, of course, to come up with nominations. And I think this time we might um, say, please um, nominate someone else, not yourself. I mean, this happens sometimes, but um, I think a good um, move is to endorse someone, <laughs> which is also common in, in RDA. You can, of course, step forward and say, I would like to, but it's always good to have someone saying, yes, this is the person <laughs> you should uh, volunteer. And our idea was um, to make sure that this time we um, get it also right in terms of diversity of, of uh, co-chairs in terms of that we would ask you to nominate someone either from Africa, Latin America, Middle East, Asia, Pacific. So um, the regions which we currently do not cover and from the statistics of RDA, um, which I have uh, seen from, from this meeting, of course, it's again very heavy on uh, the US, uh, Northern Euro, um, America, and also Europe. And the other countries, including Latin America, are not so well represented. You, I mean, I have a colleague who uh, was supposed to speak at this meeting, but he's not registered participant, so I will show a video later. Um, so um, let's, let's work on this, and uh, hopefully we can then also um, push a little bit that we get some schemes which makes it possible for them to join, which is often, of course, a cost issue. I mean, in terms of uh, knowing in time that there are scholarships and promoting them to the community and also maybe asking for some extra tickets late, <laughs> late registrations because the scholarships are often rather early. 
So um, agenda for today. Um, next slide. Uh, we have um, rather short updates, I think, on group activities. This is not a group with lots of task groups. Um, some groups, interest groups work like this, but at the moment we are um, mostly organizing these uh, plenary sessions. And then we have a bunch of interesting presentations in terms of getting a nail into the wall in terms of fear from the library perspective. Um, not so much looking into policies, which is kind of understood that this is the way to go, but looking into both the training side, the services side and the infrastructure side. And I think they look very interesting. <laughs> so, and I hope you all will uh, engage in the discussion. So we, we don't have, have any Mentimeter or something. So we really want you to speak up and um, ask questions and please don't hesitate. And uh, we are, I mean, I'm not the next speaker, right? And so in that sense, it, it doesn't matter if you are perfect in what you come up with. There's no, um, I mean, every question is very welcome. So the first presenter, and I think it's, um, I know, let's just stay with the uh, agenda, please. And then we hand over to Christina. This is for a couple of questions, maybe for later. So Chris, you can stop sharing now and maybe introduce Christina or whatever. Yeah, can. so um, I don't know, just to check if Andy is, is in the room. I didn't. I don't think I see her yet, uh, but. Um, oh, there. there she is. Oh, okay, if you wanted to briefly introduce yourself, but we're moving on to the presentations as well. Move it on. Say hi, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Andy. Uh, I'm another co-chair and yeah, that's all. A little more about yourself. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is so stressful. Um, I work at Virginia Tech. I have been a co-chair for this group for a couple of years at least. Um, and uh, I think this is a great group. We always put together interesting plenaries and I hope that you enjoy the lightning talks and the presentations. Yeah, sorry for uh, rushing Andy. <laughs> but um, also I just wanted to, uh, I have the our agenda up here and I just briefly wanted to um, uh, bring up some of the recent uh, work. So there's this top 10 uh, fair data and software things, uh, which we linked to and on the 23 research data things, um, the uh, there have been some um, uh, translated versions of that recently, and I, I included the Dutch uh, version. So, this is just a brief update of, of some of the, some of the working group activity uh, that's happened. And uh, I believe that uh, Birgit might have shared the um, yeah the the notes. So uh, that's good. Uh, so yeah, um, I will stop sharing my screen, and I will uh, hand it over to our first speaker. So that's Christina Hetney, and if you wanted to. Uh, um, introduce yourself briefly and to share your screen. So let me stop. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the talk as well. I'm Christina Hetner from the Leiden University Libraries in the Netherlands. I work at the Center for Digital Scholarship as a digital scholarship librarian um, with expertise on data management and open access. So I will start sharing my screen. Okay. Mm. So I will talk to you about metadata for machines, <clears throat> workshops and uh, fair implementation profiles to support researchers fair data decisions. So <clears throat> I was preparing this talk and then I was thinking, how do libraries actually support researchers in making their data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable or fair by machines? So we actually have the, the fair guiding principles that were published now almost five years ago. And um, when people think about fair, they usually think about the acronym FAIR, but it's actually about 
these principles that are actually quite technical. And yeah, we have been working lately on looking into how to support this really machine actionable part of fair data. So <clears throat> some common fair data library services for researchers are like leading practices. So we ask them to write a data management plan. And when I say we, I mean, I, in general libraries, so not only uh, Leiden, but uh, you know, data management plans are widely, uh, very widely used now uh, for training. We train them in uh, fair data awareness usually. And we also, you know, we support them in answering questions on how to make the data fair. So these services are usually about helping researchers making data available as a package in a repository. So it will be findable and accessible, but not so much about making the data inside the package truly fair or interoperable and reusable for machines. And researchers need to model their data um, and they used to need to use control vocabularies to encode data and the main specific metadata to annotate their data. So how to support them in making these choices? So I will talk to you about the metadata for machine workshops and uh, for implementation profiles. So what is a metadata for machines workshop or an M4M? Well, it's a workshop where researchers and data stewards work together to create a metadata schema for data sets based on agreements on metadata standards and controlled vocabularies. So yeah, well, any tool to create machine actionable metadata schemas can be used, of course. Um, we, in the workshops I've been participating in, we have been using CDAR and CDAR is, or the Center for Expanded Data Annotation and Retrieval is, uh, was established in 2014 to create a computational ecosystem for development, evaluation, use, and refinement of medical metadata. But we see now that it's also being taken up or it can be used by other type of data as well. It's not really specific by, to biomedical metadata. And that is by um, defining metadata templates. So yeah, CEDAR uses a library of such templates to help scientists submit annotated data sets to appropriate online data repositories. So what do we actually mean with a metadata schema here? Well, it should be a machine actionable description of a data set. So for example, there is the CEDAR OpenView COVID-19 metadata instance about uh, identifying a use, a, a, case, a case report. And then you have on the left here, you see that the patient information, just some, uh, a part of it. And then you see the metadata in JSON-LD. So it can also be in, in RDF, but JSON-LD is a bit more understandable for people <laughs> when, we, uh, when we look at it. She would see here the, the age and years, it's a value and it's a different type. And we also, uh, yeah, the, it should all be implemented using ontologies and uh, yeah, linked uh, data basically. So when do we actually organize a metadata for machine workshop? Well, when there is a need to make decisions about which metadata standards and control vocabularies to use for a research project. So for example, now uh, we're in the middle of running a number of workshops from the Dutch funder ZonMW. They have a COVID program and they organize these workshops to support the researchers and data stewards in making fair machine actionable metadata for all the 50 funded projects. Actually, I think there might be even more now, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing uh, call. And I put down the link there to, for you to read a, bit, a little bit more. Um, I'm looking at the time, seems okay. So what's the fair implementation profile? 
Our fair implementation profile or FIP is a list of resources selected by a community for implementing the fair principles. For example, for F1, you would say, okay, the identifier type, you need to state which identifier type you use, such as, for example, the DUI. For A11, uh, it will be the communication protocol as HTTP, for example. For I1, the knowledge representation language, for example, RDF. I2, control vocabulary, such as DDI. For R1, the license, such as CC BY. And I put down a reference here to a preprint that was released recently um, for you if you want to read more about the specifics of the FIPS. But maybe to go into a little bit more about what community is. So a community um, is a self-defined organization composed of more than one person sharing a common interest that aspires to the creation of fair data and services. That's how we define it in, in the FIP environment. And here I just put in some logos of uh, organizations that have been creating FIPs, FIPs recently. We are running these workshops at the moment as well. Um, so how do you actually create one? Well, you fill out a questionnaire in the FIP wizard, which is a specific instance of the data stewardship wizard where you can also use to um, uh, fill out a DMP, but we repurposed it for this. And then you export the answers as a PDF or a JSON file or as nano publications, which are essentially RDF triples. And this is just a screenshot of the questionnaire. So you see, it's not extremely long, um, but uh, yeah, if you answer all these questions, you will basically produce your FIP. And well, how do you actually use it after that? And I have to say, this is still, this is work in progress. So I can imagine for individual researchers, we can, um, it would be very useful for them if you connect FIPS to DMPs for default answers for implementing FAIR. So there was a hackathon on the um, MA DMPs in May and I went there uh, or not online, <laughs> went there virtually to, to work on this. So yeah, but this is a uh, work in progress. And for research communities, you could also look at the fair convergence matrix to see how others in uh, the domain have chosen to implement fair. And this is definitely working progress now. So we're preparing it for the, um, uh, for a conference coming up that I will mention. Uh, yeah, in one of my other uh, later slides, but I just wanted to say also that, so how or when to organize a FIP workshop. Again, when a community needs to make a choice how to implement FAIR. So for example, at the start of a collaborative research project. And this is just a schema of how it works. So you have a, and for each community, a data steward, a workshop scribe. You have agenda common notes, you have workshop instructions, you build your FIP using um, the wizard plus another tool that's integrated that will create the nano publications or the RDF triples. And then you can publish it as a PDF uh, and nano publications. And in the end, it will go into this convergence matrix. I put the link to the OSF or the Open Science uh, Framework to um, if you want to read more. And finally, I would like to say to how to engage in this work because we are doing this uh, mainly voluntarily, but uh, now it's recently also been uh, funded by this is on MW funder um, to run some of these workshops, but mainly it's on voluntary. So we have different working groups and working together with GoFair. And um, yeah, you can also contact the GoFair office or me if you're interested in joining this. And I mentioned the International Fair Convergence Symposium. On the, we will have a session on the 30th of November when we talk about, do we report out on all these uh, workshops that we are running at the moment and uh, the, 
their, their results and actually showing the matrix as, uh, as a product. Yes. I think it was quite on time, I hope so. I, I don't, I didn't catch uh, any questions. Uh, oh, okay, Marta had one come in at the, uh, just recently. So um, we can at least take that. What if there are no existing community agreed metadata standards for a given type of data? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, so that is actually where we also, um, you can use these metadata for machine workshops to, um, to create one. So, but then you would also need to have someone, of course, with the, uh, the expertise in building um, ontologies or building vocabularies. So depending on, um, yeah, what we would do is to first check, is there, you know, are there available standards? And if not, then you would have to, uh, yeah, maybe expand the workshop with a setting, uh, with a section about indeed really creating one. That's also a possibility. And Joy has another question. I mean, if you would like to say to the person. Yeah, sure. Um, just thanks very much. That was a great overview. I think you guys are doing some excellent stuff. Um, I just wanted to ask how, how you get people to know what FIPS already exists. So if I'm a researcher in a certain sub-discipline and somebody's created a FIPS, um, how would I know how to find it? And then how do you encourage people to reuse it? rather than maybe coming up with um, the same fit for the same, a different fit for the same community, if you know what I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. I, uh, one, they are all available in this FIP wizard to, um, to look at um, as FIPs, but we are actually, that's the working working progress part to really figure out what is the best way to expose this and for people to to use it and find it. I mean, at the moment they are in the in this FIP wizard and they are in a Sparkle endpoint <laughs> and they are in an Excel sheet <laughs> and. But yeah, I hope that uh, in with the, until the time here it seems a short time, but it's. Uh, just uh, hopefully give it enough time to to figure out how to um, yeah what is really the best way and um, to engage and yeah for people to find it. But that's really like yeah like I said it's a great <laughs> it is a great question. We are just not finally there yet. So All right, in the sake of uh, time. Just one, have... one last question. I mean, is the matrix supposed to, I mean, this is kind of a comparison across the FIPS, right? I mean, what is the goal? I mean, this could also help to indicate, okay, there is overlap and maybe they should merge or something. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, that's why we call it the convergence matrix. It really should help yeah. to converge in the communities. But indeed, we need to yeah, figure out how the best way to is to interact with, yeah. this, uh, with this thing and to run the analytics on it, yeah. Just an, another short uh, note. I mean, there was a session, um, I think yesterday on providing disciplinary advice on DMPs. I mean, you might get in touch with them. This was a bird of a feather session. So I think your work is very closely related to what they would like to achieve. <laughs> so <laughs> just mentioning it. So yeah. let's mo move on to the next. Yeah, on to our, sorry, so um, actually, uh, Christina, you have your work cut out in the chat. You have a lot of qu other questions, I think. So if you want to move over to there, answer some of yeah. those questions. Uh, but in the meantime, we uh, let's see how this plays out. We have uh, Wouter who, um, and if you wanted to give a brief introduction for Wouter uh, Birgit. Um, yeah, so um, unfortunately, we have Wouter only in in virtual mode, I mean, he's a, um, had a library of, uh, of uh, one of the UN um, organizations and he's based in, uh, in uh, Santiago, Santiago de Chile. And um, yeah, we have a video of him, there are no slides, but um, let's have a look. I mean, you, uh, some of you have likely attended the, the opening of the RDA plenary, so I've heard a little bit about Latin America already. <laughs> 
So um, I'll, I'll play this and see. Please yeah. let me know if there's if there's a lot of skipping, um, and if yeah. not, if if there is and it's not working out, then we can yeah we can maybe improvise here. But let me play this video. No sound yet. Chris, there is an issue with the sound, or is it just me? There's an extra option of sharing the computer sound in Zoom. I don't know if you have that enabled, Chris. It's under the sharing option somewhere. Okay, let me look for that. Um, for optimized screen share for video clip, probably. Is that it? Let me, let me try that. <laughs> I, I just got a response that no one can hear. hear that, right? Okay. No, we can't uh okay let's see if there's anything else here <laughs> closed caption uh we have a moderator right is that yeah. uh, if someone Something if our moderator yeah. can jump in is that possible Are you there, moderator? RDA moderator? Yeah, I might have to host. Okay, thanks for the troubleshooting, everyone. Uh, yeah, because I don't see anything else except for that option. Um, Chris, I think Karsten put a, a link in a in a chat with some uh, Zoom yeah. support. Yeah, yeah. Let me stop uh, screen sharing here for a second because uh, I can't see my own um, uh, settings. So sorry about this, everyone. Um, we really did want to check all these things ahead of time. Um, uh, let's see here, preferences. Uh, Karsten, do you wanna walk me through this? I, I did, uh, I am in the ultimate Zoom preferences setting area. Um, it's when you start sharing screen, there's a tick box in the bottom that says share computer sound in the Zoom uh, client. Oh yes, at the very bottom. You just uh, open the share screen and then have to tick the box. Oh, advanced sharing, Scott. Yeah, okay, I see it so now. Very basic, <laughs> nothing fancy. <laughs> Well, no, I actually don't see it. So there's an advanced sharing option. Yes, um, but I don't see that option. If you see it, Perkett, then uh, why don't you? Yeah, well, I had a, also a problem with sharing because my preferences are not. Chris, could you try to uh, just I'm... unplug your The link headphones. is there. What's that? Link... Sorry? Could you maybe just try to unplug your headphones that we should hear the sound which uh, you hear from your laptop recorded in Zoom? Maybe that could be good enough. Yeah, I unplugged, um, but also seeing this um, video option. Oh, okay, Birgit has got it. So. Can you see my screen now? Yes, but still no sound.
No, still no, no sound. sound. No. No. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry. With a try. Thought you were going to save us, Karsten. <laughs> <laughs> The link is in the notes, though. Yeah. So. One more try. Let me um, try um, the approach that uh, was just mentioned. Let's see how the quality of. La referencia. In Latin American and Caribbean, and there is a general way of sharing the crucial elements. As was shown in the Learn Project, several countries in Latin America and the Caribbean even have national policies for. Open uh, Chris, can you go back to the start? Countries such as Mexico, the... Argentina, Peru, and Chile. Chris? Yeah, he was introducing himself. I don't know if we wanted yeah. to go all the way that's, back, but yeah. Anyway, let's. Right. Greetings from Santiago de Chile. I'm Walter Chalier, chief of the Hernan Santa Cruz Library of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. I hope you and your families are all well. I'd like to thank the organizers of this RDA annual meeting for the invitation to give a perspective on fair data in Latin America and the Caribbean. I'd like to thank my library team and especially Claudia Vilches, who has helped me to prepare this presentation. As you probably know, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there is a long tradition of open access, initiatives such as Redalic, Claxo, Amelica, La Referencia. In Latin America and the Caribbean, there is a general awareness that data management and sharing are crucial elements of open science. As was shown in the LEARN project on research data management, several countries in Latin America and the Caribbean even have national policies for open data management, countries such as Mexico, Argentina, Peru and Chile. In Latin America and the Caribbean, there is also a general awareness of the benefits and the need for open science. Open science is better science in the sense that it allows better replication and validation of research outcomes, more efficiency and more inclusive approach in scholarly communication. So what are the challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean? Obviously, Latin America and the Caribbean has the same issues as everywhere else. For researchers to share their data, we need to create for them a trustful environment. Lack of trust is known as the main barrier to research data sharing and reuse. We also have to deal with the challenges of slow cultural change, the need to reform our models of research evaluation, eliminate, eliminate the bias with data from Global South and the lack of interoperability. But there are other challenges that are more typical for Latin America and the Caribbean. First of all, we lack data strategies at an institutional level. What is stipulated in national laws is not necessarily reflected on the institutional level, the level of implementation, because of lack of human and financial resources and sustainable infrastructures. There is no critical mass. There are only 45 data repositories from Latin America and the Caribbean registered in R3 data Dot org. There are some important gaps such as Uruguay, the Caribbean and other countries. Perhaps there are more data repositories, but then we don't see them on this map. Perhaps more data is stored, but then we don't have access. And when we talk about fairness of data in Latin America and the Caribbean, as Marie Clemola of the Core Trust Seal Board said, Research data will not become nor stay fair by magic. We need skilled people, transparent processes, interoperable technologies and collaboration to build, operate and maintain research data infrastructures. In brief, just like anywhere else in Latin America and the Caribbean, we need trained staff, 
institutional policies and sustainable infrastructures. Actually, Latin America and Caribbean data repositories score quite well on the level of access to data. There are 43 out of 45 data repositories that comply. Metadata, 44. Terms of use and licensing, 43 out of 45 comply. And policies, 37 out of 45 comply. But only half of uh, data repositories from Latin America and the Caribbean score well on the level of persistency and citability of data. And an even bigger problem lies with the certification. Only two out of the 45 repositories, both from Mexico, are either certified or support a repository standard. Why is certification important? Because of trust. Without trust, there will be no data sharing Without trust, there will be no critical mass. Nevertheless, there are some great examples of data initiatives in Latin America and the Caribbean. There is the Portal de Datos Abiertos de, of the UNAM in Mexico. There is Peru Cris project from Peru that aims to harmonize and connect research information across a variety of separate databases. There is the project RDP from Brazil, which is a partnership between the National Teaching and Research Network, the Brazilian Institute of Information and Science and Technology, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, and the Federal University of Rio Grande. There is the DACITAR portal in Argentina, which makes data available from six data repositories. There is the Datos Científicos portal in Chile and the policy proposal of open access to data and publications of the Chilean National Research and Development Agency. There is a need for partnerships with Latin America and the Caribbean. Certification of data repositories in Latin America and the Caribbean is the main challenge. Colleagues from RDA, when you write project proposals, Think of partnerships with Latin America and the Caribbean, especially partnerships that allow to move forward fast towards certification. We need projects that aim at supplying practical solutions for the use of fair data principles through the research data cycle and to foster fair data culture and the uptake of good practices in making data fair. Latin America and the Caribbean needs to gain more visibility in networks such as RDA. In that sense, it's great to see that this year's event is organized in and by Costa Rica, even if virtually. Open science is not something that stops at national borders, nor does it stop at regional borders. Open science is better science because it's inclusive, also geographically. Let me finally conclude by highlighting two recent initiatives from the UN family. First, the UN Secretary General Data Strategy, aiming at building a whole of UN ecosystem that unlocks the full UN data potential for better decisions and stronger support to people and the planet. And second, the future UNESCO recommendation on open science which is expected to be the international instrument to set standards for open science globally, which fulfill the human right to science and leave no one behind. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Uh, and <laughs> we obviously don't have Wouter here to answer any questions, but we can uh, forward any uh, that you have uh, for him in the, in the moment then. It sounds like everyone was able to hear that. Thank you um, for all the troubleshooting help um, that you provided. Um, so I'll be moving to our next um, our next uh, 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 presentation. I stalled there for a second, sorry. Um, but um, Go Fair US is our next uh, um, recording and I'll uh, present that. Hopefully you can hear this as well. Okay. Hi, welcome. I'm Christine Kirkpatrick. I'm the Division Director of Research Data Services at the San Diego Supercomputer Center at the University of California, San Diego. 
and the home for the GoFair US office. For those who aren't familiar with GoFair and where it resides in the data ecosystem, this graphic explains a bit more. Though when planning for months, this graphic accompanied a statement issued during the pandemic and highlights the complementarity and how CoData, the Research Data Alliance, the World Data System, and GoFair can work together to address data issues. While each organization plays an important role in our work, we were attracted to GoFair because of its focus on implementation and machine actionability. As we became more deeply involved, we saw a gap in connecting what was happening in the to the developing fair services, or rather lack thereof, in the United States. This is to found the U.S. Go Fair Coordination Office at SDSC. Our goal is to find working models and to bring them back for U.S. audiences in a way that is relevant to the academic landscape here. Go Fair is organized along three pillars, Go Change, Go Train, and Go Build, Go Change focuses on policies, incentives, and priorities. Go train on training and skill development, including basic awareness of FAIR. And Build focuses on FAIR technology. Implementation networks represent areas of, areas of special focus, sometimes in a particular domain. And here you can see some of the current implementation networks and where they fall along these pillars. GoFair includes an international coordination office and several country offices. Here we are last year together in Leiden for the annual implementation networks meeting. And this year's in, uh, meeting in 2020 in Hamburg had such a big group, it doesn't make as good of a picture to show. So we are growing. Even though the Go and GoFair stands for Global Open, it is also synonymous with the energy of the team. We are action oriented and use various methods for coming at problems in new ways. Just to say a little bit more about uh, the vote and implementation network, which was at the bottom of the list of implementation networks on a previous slide, part, partly because it's timely, but also because it's a good example of what GoFair is about. Within VODAN, we have the project VODAN Africa, funded in part by the Phillips Foundation and chaired by Dr. Mohamed Mapeza Mahigo, with Dr. Francesca Oladipu as executive coordinator, both from Kampala International University in Uganda. Another huge supporting force is Professor Dr. Miriam Ben Rison from Leiden University. This initiative works on three very complementary projects related to capacity building for FAIR in the US. The first is the need to train up the data stewardship workforce. The materials and the way of organizing the network of data stewards can be directly applied back here in the US. Second is the focus on metadata for machines. This is part of the skill building for the data stewards. Through a series of workshops, they are able to find gaps in metadata practices and build things from the ground up where needed. This culminates in the use of FAIR data points, another point of convergence for people who work in GoFair. Rather than use the old model of trying to collect all of the data you need into a data lake, the idea is that published data can be visited, even if this is just the metadata about the data that resides there. This allows algorithms to visit data points and to collect information that they either have access to or, it, or that is open and available. It is through these three efforts that Bodan Africa is working to create data stewardship capacity along with the infrastructure that can be used for this pandemic and future challenges. GoFair US works across the research computing landscape to find the best fair data ecosystem tools and practices available. Among our current and past offerings, our data awareness and more in-depth data stewardship training offerings. This picture is from our first week-long data stewardship training held at SDSC in 2019. This is Mark Wilkinson, who was lead author on the seminal FAIR paper from 2016. And here, uh, in, and I think I saw a few of you uh, on the webinar that are in this picture. This was for me and perhaps for you, my last uh, trip on a plane before the lockdown. February in Atlanta, Georgia for our workshop we held about advancing fair capacity in the US, um, hosted by the South Big Data, in Data Innovation Hub. Through this initial group, we're building a community of people in the US who want to build out the fair data ecosystem of tools, especially adapted for US needs. 
We have broad participation across institutions and organizations with funding from different U.S. agencies, as well as consultants ready to begin filling the gap of the estimated half a million data stewards that will be needed in our country over the next few years. As part of the Force 11 Scholarly Communications Institute this summer, Melissa Cragen, also at SDSC, and Natalie Meyer from Notre Dame and I created a template for organization, organizations to use for assessment and then mapping of their institutional goals with FAIR. The template's called the FAIR Data Stewardship Plan for Organizations and Institutions. This is now part of the three-point verification handbook mentioned on the next slide, but reach out if you'd like a copy and more information. We work to connect implementation networks in the US, especially where there's great interest. 2020 saw the first implementation network to come out of the US, the FAIR Microbiome Island. We are an active member of BODAN and BODAN Africa for the reasons I mentioned before. And in partnership with the West Big Data Innovation Hub, we hosted a four part webinar series on BODAN this past spring. And then the, at the intersection of COVID data science and FAIR, and then we had a follow-up three-part series on Vodan in Africa that examined the pandemic from the lens of each partner country, as well as common approaches and challenges. We also look towards what gaps need filling, especially coming from a research computing organization. In particular, we are standing up fair data point proof of concepts and are uh, growing that into a network of FDPs. Late this summer, we launched the new GoFair US website that details all of the different communication channels available, as well as our initiatives. See the ways to be engaged, including contributing to our reusable carpentries inspired lesson on FAIR and the three point verification handbook. And I just wanna say how thankful we are to our partners. I especially wanna highlight uh, Renzi and Chris Erdman from Renzi who have joined us on the GoFair US office declaration. Julian Schneider from Sage Bio Networks, and Nancy Vogel Heinrich for joining us in our US office. Now I'll turn it over. So yeah, we could uh, take some, Nancy and I are on this call. Uh, uh, by the way, today is a US holiday <laughs> and we also couldn't have colleagues from Australia join us because of the time. So uh, that's why we had a lot of recordings, um, but um, Nancy's on if, if anyone has a, a follow-up question for us. I'll just pause briefly. Um, and I don't know if uh, Susanna has a question. Uh, it's for Christine. <laughs> Everyone has questions. Is. Yeah, I, I, I call later, so I'm responding to a thread which is earlier. I'm sorry, Chris. No, everyone has questions for Christina. She's very pro popular right now. Um, okay, well, if you have any follow-up questions for Nancy and I, we're on the uh, call, um, but yeah, as as uh, as you know, as Christine said, we recently just launched the GoFair uh, US, and we actually have an upcoming webinar uh, December fifteenth, um, I believe. Yeah, tenth. Tenth. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> Mixing up dates and times, and but tenth. Yeah, December tenth. Uh, if anyone wants to join that, and it's uh, it's announced on our uh, website. Um, so you could uh, go there. Maybe uh, we can provide the link there, Nancy. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, otherwise I'll move on um, to our next uh, uh, presentation, which is actually, uh, we uh, we couldn't, uh, she couldn't join us, Liz, as I mentioned. Um, Christina's on the line as well. And uh, we can just give a brief update on the FAIR lesson and I'll bring that up here. Um, so there was a recent blog post um, just uh, covering what we did. And uh, um, so what we were trying to do is um, create um, a common fair lesson. Um, and, and in the recent sprint that we run, uh, ran from August 27th to 28th, um, we had uh, people um, from a variety of institutions and countries involved, um, um, but primarily in Europe, actually. Um, uh, many of the particip participants were there. and. We spent a good uh, deal of time talking about the audience for that lesson and the audience we um, came upon was because I think some of the content is still kind of directed towards um, li libraries um, and we directed it more towards researchers in, in the, uh, the sprint. Um, and then also we looked at key you know, objectives and, and key um, 
key takeaways um, for these lessons for these lessons and sort of help frame um, frame the lesson moving forward, the development. Um, and we added to some of the modules as well. We updated some of them. So one of the examples is on assessment is one that had some recent updates, um, but still is a work in progress. Um, and so, you know, really we're trying to merge the rest of those um, 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 submissions that we had and, and revisit this. Um, Christina, Liz, and I um, have kids, <laughs> have, have <laughs> so other challenges in our life at the moment. So we haven't been able to get back to it, um, but hopefully um, in the holidays. Um, but this is a chance to actually see if anyone else is interested in, um, in joining us. And we have hopes of moving this to the, the Carpentries Incubator Program. So this is a lesson very much developed in sort of carpentry style of doing things. And we want to move it there that so it can get the eyes of researchers. Uh, I, I think there are more um, researchers in the Carpentries community, but there are about 2,000 on Slack at least, uh, two to 3,000. Um, so we'd like to get in, in the eyes of, of them uh, to get their feedback. And then also we, we, we're, you know, we may also consider moving it over to RDA or um, go fair as, as an option. Um, so we're still um, thinking about it there. Um, but um, I don't know if there's anything else I missed to Christina here, um, if you wanted to capture anything. But I just wanted to share the lesson um, for the moment and share the link. Uh, so if anyone has um, any questions, um, or Christina, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, thank you, Chris, for uh, for, for presenting this. Um, I I think we have come a really long uh, way, actually, compared to what, how the what the lesson looked like before for the sprint and. As Chris said, it's like the, the last 20%, you know, which usually take the, the most of the time. So that, that sort of finishing up stuff, polishing and uh, finishing some parts of the, of the lesson. So yeah, if, you, if, if someone wants to help out and um, look over it and see if there is your specific expertise. Um, so as you can see, for example, the, yeah, the reusable, um, the interoperable, uh, also the accessible, I think, yeah, still needs uh, needs some work. So yeah, it's uh, that would be helpful. Yeah, and it looks like we have uh, one question. Does Fair Carpentry have uh, relations with Data Carpentry? Um, how much training should um, be Fair specific versus data issues, including Fair? Um, so yeah, the carpentry is, is an umbrella for um, data carpentry, software carpentry, library carpentry, and then high performance computing carpentry is another one coming coming on. So they're they're the umbrella, and um, yes, there is um, um, relations between those uh, <laughs> those different uh, less uh, lesson programs as they call them. Um, and so um, yeah, I think our hope is to bring more um, data carpentry people in as well, um, software carpentry as well, um, by moving to the incubator and on the um, uh, on the hackathon or the uh, the lesson sprint. Sorry, um, we had uh, um, Toby from the Carpentries who um, you know reaches out across those communities um, to help us, you know, make those connections as well. So. Um, yeah, that's the next step. Um, and as far as your data related question, yeah, we do have some examples in, in this FAIR lesson. We have some software related examples. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit broader than that. Um, and um, if you're interested, if you wanted to tackle some of those um, data related questions, we'd be welcome. You'd be welcome to join us and, and provide um, some input. We, um, we have a, we've developed a Slack we, we created a Slack for um, Slack channel for uh, the lesson sprint in um, the Carpentries community. So um, it'd be great to have anyone uh, join that as well. And I can um, hopefully provide that link later on, or maybe uh, Christina, if you could help me <laughs> with providing that link to the channel, at least maybe. Um, you mean but... in, the, in, in the chat here or? 
Uh, yeah, in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I yeah. can uh, have a look. But I'll be moving on. <laughs> Maybe yeah. mentioning that we indeed also with this fair lesson, we just really want to be, you know, uh, not afraid of the technical part, but still balancing the sort of introduction to it. So yeah, that is the, this is the challenge with this lesson. We don't want to be too, too superficial and really do some hands-on, you know, working with fair, what is actually this machine actionable or readability part of, of fair. Yeah, we definitely had people um, contributing versus via Google Doc as well, and uh, um, potentially opening those Google, uh, you know, Etherpad or is another option, but um, participating that way as well um, in a mode that they're comfortable. So uh, we want it to be very much open, as <laughs> Christina says. Um, so I'll, I'll let Christina answer that question in um, chat um, from Ina. Uh, I'll move on in the sake of time um, for our next uh, video. Again, this is our, our these are our um, Australian colleagues that couldn't join us because of the time, but they pre-recorded. And so let me um, start this and, and cross my fingers. Um, you have their the videos and slides if you can also look at them later, but let me um, present. Hello, my name is Natasha Simons and I'm presenting this with my colleague Liz Stokes. We are from the Australian Research Data Commons and today we're going to talk about our approach to fair data skills and training. The Australian Research Data Commons, or ARDC for short, is funded by the Australian Federal Government to give Australian researchers competitive advantage through data. ARDC is focused on the development of research data infrastructure tools, platforms and skills at a national level, that is across the whole of Australia. We do this by partnering and co-investing in projects and initiatives with research institutions and organisations. Fair data is a key focus for ARDC. It is the policy of the government program that funds the ARDC that data generated, created, captured or stored by our funded projects will be made available based on the fair principles. We provide national leadership in promoting and enabling fair data, and we have services available to the whole Australian research sector to back that up. While ARDC is focused on the development of research data infrastructure, that investment will be wasted if we don't tell people about it or give them the skills to use it. Coming into 2020, the COVID situation forced many of us around the world to work from home. Opportunities for face-to-face -face delivery of data skills disappeared overnight. Being a national organisation, ARDC staff are located across Australia. For example, Liz is in Sydney while I am in Brisbane. So we spend our days in Zoom meetings and we are used to presenting virtually. We sensed the opportunity presented by the COVID situation and launched a Fair Data 101 virtual course. The course was free of charge and hugely successful, leading us to deliver a second, shorter course called Fair Data 101 Express. In addition to the Fair Data courses, ARDC presented an Australia-wide National Data and EU Search Skills Summit last month, and we are leading an important piece of work on mapping the Australian skills landscape. I'll now hand over to Liz to talk to you in more detail about the Fair Data 101 courses, the summit, and the mapping the skills landscape work. All right, so let me play Liz's uh, video. Thanks, Natasha. And hello everyone, my name is Liz Stokes and I'm excited to share some reflections on our FAIR Data 101 courses this year and highlight where community interest is heading in terms of the Skills Summit and landscape mapping. So when COVID hit, we were looking for where we could leverage our networks and experience and highlight the work of our partners in dealing with the challenges of implementing the FAIR principles. An opportunity emerged to provide and pivot online like everybody else, a fair training course open to people across the research sector. 
Natasha's Fair Data in the Scholarly Communications Lifecycle face-to-face -face course that is run at uh, the Force 11 Scholarly Communications Institute every year formed the structure and we developed new content, content which was specific to the Australian context. We ran the course twice in two experiments to inform the landscaping work and test some ideas on scaling training and what good training might look like. So our central concern was to how to provide meaningful and engaging content because staying the course in a MOOC requires a superhuman effort. In pivoting online, we also wanted to create a learning environment that encouraged a community of learners, given that many organizations were extra distributed and business as usual was not a thing. We had a unique opportunity to put a fairly intensive effort into the kind of course we'd like to attend. Also, we wanted to try out aspects of the carpentry's um, wheelhouse about facilitating a positive learning environment, scaffolding discussions with clear templates and explicit participant roles. We coordinated five groups of about 16 learners. The total uh, course participant um, size was about 80. And these uh, tutorials were supported by two aid ARDC staff. We assigned at reasonably random the following roles that circulated throughout the group. A discussion leader to pro prompt discussion, a note taker to record that discussion, and two challenger roles to ask devil's advocate quest type questions or the sorts of tricky questions you might feel awkward in voicing to a room full of strangers or professional colleagues unless you've been specifically asked to do so. So here's the thinking behind these explicit participant roles. It's not only about people feeling emotionally safe in a learning environment, but the opportunity to provide, to apply emerging professional skills, which are part of the new normal. As I mentioned before, we had capped participants at 80 people and limited to Australia. For the participants in our first round, it was 10 hours over eight weeks, including joining live webinars, doing activities, quizzes and community discussion participation. Uh, each of those webinars and discussions had a post survey to prompt further questions and ask if anything was unclear. These were built into the rolling FAQ document uh, that was updated throughout the course and shared on the community Slack channel. Frequent opportunities to receive and act on feedback is another hallmark of Carpentry's skills instruction. And this participant feedback here um, shows what um, shows the real desire for fair real talk and grappling with practical challenges for implementation. The course was really well received and by the end the expressions of interest for um, attending another course or participating in another course had grown to over 200. However we couldn't sustain that same effort and we were keen to experiment with scale. So we used this opportunity to migrate the course materials to markdown format and host it all together on a GitHub repository using the GitHub pages feature to create a one stop shop for all the course materials. This also gave us an opportunity to improve skill and confidence in using pull requests for update workflows and documenting decisions using issues on GitHub. The popular expression for this is eating our own dog food. And yes, to any librarians wondering, I used an image of a golden retriever absolutely on purpose. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the shape of both courses. We actually kept the Express Slack workspace open for another two weeks beyond the month, since a few participants had bemoaned how they'd saved everything up until the last week. And here's a link to the course materials page for the FAIR 101 Express. So I encourage you to um, follow that and have a big look through. To turn now to back to the summit, here is a top level view of the landscape mapping that Natasha had mentioned earlier, showing communities for skills and workforce development. Now by landscape, we actually mean a taxonomy. This is a categorization of skills and it's a tool for identifying the skills to have conversations around who's doing what 
across the e-research and data skills sector and where are the gaps? Um, the people at e-research and data skills summit were much broader than the data curation and stewardship um, areas, which is ostensibly the area that we work in. And in fact, that was reflected by the working groups that emerged at the end of the summit. So I will show those to you too, okay? Um, so these training, these working groups um, included a train the trainer schedule to um, schedule of events to enhance the quality of e-research and data skills training, a national trainer registry and calendar for information sharing, a working group to attend to the practicalities of jointly developed training materials, and finally, a working group to address career progression of e-research support roles. And please, I know this is a quite a international group here. Um, we are in close contact with EOSC and Elixir's work in similar efforts in terms of national training registries and calendars. So um, uh, yes, we're well aware of the things they're doing, um, but we do welcome any feedback if you've got suggestions to make. And that's the end. So I look forward to um, hearing what happens at this, um, at the rest of your plenary. Thank you. All right, thanks virtual Liz. <laughs> so you can see Liz and we, we can uh, forward on um, any questions you, you might have for um, Natasha and Liz. Um, but in the meantime, um, let me actually uh, stop sharing and I can pass the baton off to Joy. Okay, I'm gonna try to share, see if it works. Okay, I won't do my video, audio, and screen at the same time because my internet probably won't cope with it. So, hi everyone, my name is Joy Davidson. I'm with the Fair is Fair project, and I'm just going to run you through, um, in a very brief fashion, some of the work we're doing in the Fair is Fair project on repository support. Um, I know I won't cover everything, and I think I've got a couple of colleagues in the audience, um, so if I miss anything, they can also flag things up in the chat afterwards. So just a, a brief bit about Fair is Fair. Uh, we're funded by the European Commission. Uh, we're part of a suite of projects that are looking to help realize the, the vision of the European Open Science Cloud. And obviously we're focusing primarily on improving uh, fair policies, practice and services. So we're uh, 22 partners. We started in March last year and we run until February, 2020. This is a, just a brief screenshot of all the different partners. I've, you can look at that at your leisure later on. Um, again, just to, to pick up really what we were trying to do in the project is to get a sense of you know, what's happening in, in the current landscape in Europe, but also more broadly, uh, what are the current fair policies and practices and how can we better work together to try and make sure that we can realize this, this vision of a functioning European Open Science Cloud. Um, and we're looking to work with uh, a, a huge range of different stakeholders, but repositories and uh, universities and research uh, librarians are definitely key stakeholders that we're looking to engage with over the course of the project. So some of the work packages, um, you can see here, we've got six work packages across the whole project. Out of those three, deal specifically with repositories. So we've got uh, work package two, which is looking at semantics and interoperability, and it's providing some dedicated support to help uh, repositories to improve their, their um, activities in these areas. I lead the, the data policy and practice work package. Um, it's broader than just repositories, but definitely repositories are a stakeholder we're looking to work with. And we also have a dedicated work package that is working with repositories who are seeking to move towards certified status, um, especially those that are looking to get core trust deal certified. So repositories and, and people who work in repositories, whether they're at research performing organizations or uh, research infrastructures, um, these are the, the kinds of people we're working with 
and who we're hoping that we can um, keep the collaborations going with and try to implement some changes over the rest of the project. I just wanted to, to touch on a couple of things that I think would be of interest to this working group. Uh, the first one is a tool that we've developed. It's uh, in the early stages, so it's still being refined. Um, and it's called Fair Aware. And this tool is essentially a means of helping researchers and also data stewards to really try to get a sense of how much they know about the FAIR principles. So it's a self-assessment tool on skills, essentially. Um, and it, it can be used. We've kind of been thinking primarily about using it before somebody deposits selected data into a repository so they know what kind of um, things to look for to make a, a, an informed decision about whether their data is fair before they deposit it. But equally, the tool can be used at different stages of the, the research life cycle. So um, we would, example, for example, think that um, people could start looking at using these tools um, at the data management planning stage. So starting to think about the kinds of questions to ask and getting some tips from the, the tool to think about what they might do to improve the fairness of, of their data. So the tool is available for people to try. Um, we're also trying it out for use in, in training activities, which is something that Ferris Fair is also working on. So by all means, if anybody would like to come and give the tool a try for any number of different purposes, um, we'd be delighted to, to hear about it and to, to support you if you want to, to uh, make use of it. Another thing we're, we're working on um, is to, to look at fair data um, assessment metrics. And we've come up with 17. Um, we, we haven't pulled these out of thin air. These are building on um, the metrics and indicators that have come out of the fair data maturity model working group and various other activities. Um, what we're kind of doing at the moment is refining that. It's, it's a work in progress. So you can uh, click on the link below to get uh, a bit more information on what of the, the metrics are. Um, we've got some use cases on how and when they might be used, but I think one of the gaps we've noticed, and, and this is something perhaps for all of us to think about, is that you know we've got a lot of different metrics that people can think about and, and how to assess whether your data is fair, whether your practices are fair or your services are fair. But what is still a little bit woolly is um, what sorts of evidence might be um, something that we can all agree upon to say that yes, we believe that something is fair. So there, there's still some work to be done. Um, metrics on them on their own really can't be used. So we're, we're looking to try and get more uh, community traction around thinking about these kinds of agreed sources of evidence that we can use. Another tool that we're working on, um, this is a different sort of a tool is it's meant to help people who um, are at the repository side and want to start to see how fair their data holdings are. So we've come up with a tool that's called Fuji, and it helps people to do an automated assessment of their data holdings. And it, it again builds on the metrics that we've developed. Um, it's openly available right now. So there is a source code in, in GitHub, and you can uh, have a try with the tool yourself. We also have um, people who are willing to help you if you want to try and run your own assessment. So get in touch with us if you, if you want to do that. Have a look at the website and you can get in touch with us if, if that's something that is of interest. But again, it's, it's certainly something that we think um, could have wider uses than just for repositories at, at that side. We might think about how it could be used in different, uh, different use cases as well. So for the last couple of slides, I just wanted to, to run through a couple of the different activities we're doing. So um, I mentioned we're doing quite a bit on, on semantics, interoperability, and services. Um, and my colleagues who are leading that work have been working with 12 different repositories who um, responded to an open call that we had back in 2019. And they've been working to try and, and implement some solutions. Um, several you've already heard about, um, looking at things like the, the machines for machines workshops, um, fair data points, and, and we're looking to share the lessons learned. So the, the repositories that we've been working with in a dedicated sense, um, we will be pulling out some of the information um, on what we've been doing there and trying to make that more accessible to other repositories. 
And you can see there's a few links uh, to some deliverables that you might want to read on the right hand side. So we've got a, an assessment report on the fairness of services and also a, a second report on requirements for uh, persistence, in, in, persistence and interoperability. So um, have a look at those if you have time. And I've included the, the work package lead there if you have any questions. So it's Jessica Carland and you can get in touch. Uh, my own work package is the policy and practice work package. Uh, we're really trying to work with a lot of different stakeholders, so funding bodies, uh, repositories, but also organizations and researchers and research communities to try and, and improve policy and practice. So the work that we've been doing to date has been to come up with some policy enhancement recommendations. We've come up with, I think, roughly about 17 or 18 different recommendations. Um, that people could consider to try and make their, their policies more fair aligned. Um, more recently, we have come up with a description of uh, support that we can offer to repositories. And, and this was at for public consultation over the summer. Uh, we're now working to prioritize the areas that people fed back on and we'll be rolling out that support program over 2021 and 2022. Another area that people might be interested um, it is something that's coming up for us, which is uh, a little pilot that we're doing to um, integrate metadata catalogs. Uh, so this is something that we'll be sharing probably um, in the Arizona community within the next uh, week or so. So I'll, I'll maybe update this and send the link as soon as, as it's available. I mentioned FAIR certification is, is a dedicated work package. Um, and here's some links to things that you can, you can uh, come and have a look at. Um, similar to what we've been doing with the semantics and the interoperability, we have a cohort of 10 uh, repositories that we're working with in a dedicated fashion. And again, they were selected based on uh, responses to an open, uh, an open call. Uh, and the 10 selected repositories have been working away now for almost a year, uh, trying to prepare to apply for core trust seal certification. Um, so what we will be doing is trying to, again, share some of the lessons learned. Um, and I think it's important to stress here that it's not necessarily just for uh, repositories that want to reach certified status. Um, the, the lessons learned are really just going to be useful for anybody who is looking to become more fair enabling. So we'll be sharing those, as I mentioned, through our uh, repository support program coming up in 2021 and 2022. Uh, I think that's more or less everything I, I wanted to touch on. It's not giving you a huge amount of information about all of the, the activities, but we certainly are, are keen to hear from anybody who is interested to learn a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of links here that you can uh, come and check out what we're doing and keep up to date. And um, I'll stop now. And if there's any questions, happy to take them. Uh, Joy, you had... Uh... I guess more, more or less a comment from uh, Susanna about uh, um, alignment with other tools, autom automated assessment mm. tools that are out there. Um, at the moment, um, they're not, we're not integrated with anything else, else at the moment, but I think certainly we'd be open to trying to see how this could work. As I mentioned, um, the, the source code is available on GitHub, so there's really, um, no reason people can't start to play around with it and, and doing some testing on their own. Um, but certainly, um, uh, we're in touch with Susanna anyway. She's one of our fair champions. So um, we're happy to pick that up with you um, and discuss that a little bit further later on, if you like. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Very happy to be a fair champion. And that's exactly why I sometimes <laughs> you know, venture ask a question. Actually, my question is, it's got a different one. I wasn't, I wasn't referring to the integration with fair sharing. I, but yes, we can discuss that separately. I was talking about there are already, there have been for quite a time, some other open source automatic evaluation tool. And my question to you was, have you already assessed those? And if yes, what has made you decide to create a new one, so to speak? Uh, so the fair assist list, the many tools out there, some of which are automatic. That's why I wanted to have more an insight to understand. Uh, I, I probably have to put you in touch with my colleagues in, in Work Package 4 to okay. give you a bit more of the detailed um, information on, on the decisions made. Um, basically, I, 
when we were coming up with the, the, the core metrics that are built on the, the FAIR uh, maturity working group, um, they're, they're slightly different. So they build on it, but they are slightly different. And I think this tool was focusing on, on making use of those metrics. So that's my kind of short answer, but I think I would need to put you in touch with, with Anu and a couple of the others in Work Package 4 for more of yeah. a, a detailed answer. I would be very happy because there are existing tools who already were using the metrics pretty similar to the RDA, it could be easily fixed, but absolutely. I mean, this is just an idea to try to build on each other's work. I was wondering, that's why. I think it's great. Thank you very much. We can follow up. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, so our next, uh, we have another video, another recorded video from a colleague in Australia, um, Sarah King, and I'll open that up for all of you. I'm, I'm reaching out to Cloud Store right now, so I don't know if uh, the delay at the moment, uh, but the video is hosted there. Let me just try again. Sorry about that. I have to stop sharing, by the way, because it's in another window. <laughs> Quick time. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the Training and Engagement Lead at RNET. RNET is Australia's National Research and Education Network. We provide ultra high speed internet and communication services only to Australia's research and education sector. We connect all of the universities in Australia. And then we connect them to the world. Because of our role as the backbone infrastructure to the sector, we're well placed for our vision of a globally networked data sharing ecosystem. However, as we all know, there are still a lot of researchers who are not making the most of the infrastructure. And they're doing things like using Sneakernet, moving their data around from one place to another. They've got hard drives under their desk and they're still carrying data around or putting it in different systems that aren't built especially for research requirements. So my job is to engage with researchers to let them know what's available to them so they can begin to this road of making their data fair by first getting it out of those hard drives under their desk and then directing them to infrastructure that enables easy data sharing and collaboration and is built especially for research data needs here in Australia. And this infrastructure is known as Cloud Store. So my job is to raise awareness and lift the baseline of skills and knowledge around easy data sharing and collaboration and leveraging the network to accelerate research so that researchers can connect to each other, connect to their external collaborators and data repositories using this high speed network that we provide. At the moment, we offer three different workshops that focus on building foundational skills in working with research data in the cloud. Each of these takes an introductory look at aspects of data management, whether it's about cloud storage, data movement or reproducible data analysis. Many of us are familiar with these research data lifecycle diagrams, but we also know that too often the major focus to make data fair is at the end of the research data lifecycle. Our aim is to make it easier for research data to be made fair from the beginning of the life cycle by building useful tools and teaching researchers how to use them. 
So for the data creation and uh, deposit phase, we provide only Office uh, for open source cloud-based document creation and collaborative editing options. And I take people through uh, how to do that. For collecting data, say from instruments, uh, researchers can make use of some fast online upload tools, such as S3, WebDAV and Rocket, with automated metadata capture in development. I'm also preparing an advanced data movers workshop to build up skills in this area, and that's coming in 2021. For the analysis phase of research projects, we provide introductory training in Jupyter Notebooks and provide the hosting platform within Cloud Store for coding in the cloud. And, and that's to support reproducibility and connections. We also provide connections to HPC and Research Cloud. For the final phases of research projects, we support researchers with training and using File Sender for moving large data around. For example, uploading uh, data collections to repositories, and also the collections plugin to create data collections with a set of mandatory and optional metadata elements so that people can create uh, helpful information for future users of their data. And just finally, we've also worked on creating a sample research project folder structure and README files as a digital handout for those who are just starting out with the hope that they will begin their projects as they would finish so that their project data is, is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Thank you. I thought I had closed Zoom down. Um, so I think that, um, let me see if I could share um, again our agenda, but I think we're at the tail end of our agenda. And um, I don't think we have time to actually, uh, we've, we've had some discussion in here. And at Birgit, I don't know if you wanted to follow up here. Um. I'm not quite sure <laughs> what you were. <laughs> no, saying. you you asked everyone to add their names, and I think yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I just um, noted that we didn't ask this in the beginning. So <laughs> please, if you could take a minute to write down your name and affiliation. I mean, we um, we're not collecting contact information, I would say, but um, and um, but we also have, we're, yeah. We are also interested if you have other if you have your own. Fair related projects to include them in um, in this section, um, and we can we hopefully want to um, you know just curate those and share them as well. So if um, next to your name, if there's anything that you wish to um, to share, please let us know. Um, don't go crazy and share like ten or twenty. <laughs> we're we're looking for maybe like your you know one or two examples. So. Um, that would be great. And I think that's about it as far as wrapping it up, Birgit, right? Is yes. That... Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, as we mentioned before, we're going to send out a call for um, a new co-chair and, you know, um, I guess in next week or two. Um, mm -hmm. So look for our communication there. Once RDA is finished, all the dust is settled. So, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but thanks everyone. Um, and we'll see you out there in RDA land uh, at other meetings. Uh, yeah, so hopefully sometime <laughs> in the future. <laughs> we'll meet again. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you all. Bye. Nice evening or day. <laughs> bye bye. Can stop recording. <laughs>